Thank you all for being here. I know everyone is super exhausted, so ah, taking that big breath and a little stretch before beginning, and really thank you for staying around and sharing your time. Um, so this topic <laughs> um, came up to my life for uh, dealing our community and being a community organizer. And I do have to first, before starting, actually acknowledge how brave Foss backstage it is to accepting this talk, because it can be a quite of a delicate subject. So really thank you for the opportunity to share those thoughts with you. And when I created this talk, it was because I, do, I did feel so unprepared when that happened to my community. And this is a perspective from a community organizer to help you <laughs> when you become in my position to have some tools at hand to deal with that. Um, or some sort of like a toolbox or essential tools to deal with what the heck you actually can do when the code of conduct is broken. Uh, this is me, so I am Paloma Oliveira. I have been involved with open source for quite a while, um, a lot in South, South America and here in Berlin now. And I am one of the organizers of PyLadies Berlin, uh, which is a volunteer-based community. It is all around the world, but we have this chapter in Berlin. And my full-time job is at Source Labs. I am a developer relations. I'm taking care specifically of open source communities. And that means that I'm thinking about communities all the time. So in my free time, I'm at PyLadies, or I'm mentoring a Fraun loop, or I'm working full-time with that. And understanding and taking care of the communities for them to feel safe, it's always in my head. Um, and just so I can understand you around, could you do some raising hands or signaling if have you yourself ever got involved into some organization of an event or a community? Uh, <laughs> are you yourself a community organizer? Cool. And do you, have you ever, you who organize those stuff, have you actually been prepared to do that? <laughs> um, have you been prepared to deal with human nature in those events? <laughs> you who were interested in that, I have to talk to you to understand the human condition. Uh, so the code of conduct that today is a very, everyone knows, everyone hears, is there in the, the wall, it's written there all around. I believe there is no event that can exist nowadays, uh, nor community that can do not have a code of conduct. That's pretty standard. And I want to acknowledge that that started around 2009 when someone very brave, that is Caroline Ada Emke, I, I, sorry, I don't know you in person, I'm sorry if I say your name wrongly all the time. But I want to acknowledge that this person started this project called Code Covenant after interacting a lot with autonomous communities that thought that was the best way to deal with humans. Like, let's be autonomous and free. And uh, it's being understood today for several reasons that's not quite. And this is why the Code Covenant, which today we mainly call Code of Conduct, was born. And it was kind of created to be a safety card, but and I do like the metaphor, just like the airplane's uh, safety instructions, who actually reads all of the code of conduct in the event they go? Interesting. There are some hands I want to acknowledge for the ones that's not here that there are some hands. Mostly, they are taken for granted, because we believe we know where the exits are. No, they are always there in the back, I don't care. Or, and we believe that we know the code of conduct as well. They are all the same. Are they, really? What do they say? <laughs> they are meant to create and to foster our safe environments, but mostly to protect the ones who feel uncomfortable and in open source. This is a great conference, not the case all the time. They are when a code of conduct um, is there to feel the ones that are there and are feeling uncomfortable because they're being represented for people that do not represent them, they have, we have to find a way to make them feel comfortable. This is why it exists. And what it has to count, what, what do we need there? Well, basically it's a rule to say, well, if something happened, 
How can it happen? And we think about that as a manual, that it's super clear and like a, a Scandinavian style, beautiful pieces, they're easily got together. And this is what we ended up with. It can be fairly complicated because this common agreement on this rule, how, how clear is actually that? And when we start reading the, the Code of Conduct, there are some things that they do look very nice on the paper, um, but we're humans. And the misunderstandings, the most of the time, if you're in the communities you see uh, or probably live there, they are in between the lines. They are not so clear that you actually know how to deal with. And the one thing that to me particularly strikes is when me, a non-prepared volunteer person dealing with an organization, I read that it's my responsibility as an organizer to enforce the code of conduct that I do not fully understand. That freaks me out. One, because of the force. Obviously, I do not have that, even if I want to. But it does uh, bothers me somehow, like, uh, which tools do I actually have to enforce it? This is not a law. I cannot call some number or authority that will do something. I am the organizer I have to deal with. So thinking about that, those are my tips for you. And I don't know if that's a karma or not. This is like the third time I try to give this talk. And every time I do give the talk, something happened, and I sum up uh, incidents to the talk. <laughs> so those are one of the takeaways. And those were the first ones we find out really fast. First of them, when you're in the position of organizer, we tend to really take the responsibility and feel like it's my responsibility for my community to feel safe and try to uh, personate, impersonate kind of the hero. And uh, I've seen that happening. Please don't do that yourself. Don't put yourself as target. Do not act impulsively and try to solve it right away. Trust that this is a community thing and you are not alone to do it. So the most important thing, do not put yourself as a target. Things can scale up very fast, and you won't be able to stop a hurricane. So avoid making any kind of decisions alone and with your front face on it. Be behind the wall of the community. Um, the second thing is having those clear processes. And if you don't know what is a clear process or how it can it look like, um, there's this great guideline uh, made by Mozilla that kind of guide you exactly what happened. So if something happened, you send an email, and that email should contain that and that with a date. So it's a clear process. That also happens if you felt un hurt in some event or some whatever you're organizing, you know who to reach out to and which will be the steps that is going to happen. And that has a lot to do with uh, uh, Don was speaking today about how do you feel, or oh, no, or, or Claire in the morning, saying that will slow down a lot all the anxiety and the pressure because you know what has to happen. The third thing is, if this is a community, instead of just uh, downloading and duplicating the code of conduct, Try to actually write it down and take the time to write it with the language your community actually understand. Um, try to create it together. That can be quite complicated, especially if your community is too large, but it is something that ideally will make sense. So instead of having a hundred lines of possible things, write three, but they are clear that this is a, a, an agreement and it does make sense for your community. Fourth, seek for help. You don't need to have all the answers and or all the uh, perspectives. When the, f the first time something happened to our community, I seek help for Elliot Vey, and which is a gender major studies, and she brought a lot of uh, restorative justice perspective to our community. And that was quite important when we were like, a, really, I don't know what to do. This situation happened, it scaled up quite quickly. This organizer became a full target, being menaced to several things. We don't know what to do. How, how do you do that? And the first, uh, and Elliot brought many tips. Some of them, um, I will put it in the resources guide to help broaden our perspective and going out of this really corridor we feel trapped in. And the fifth, it is to consider instead of a pun punishment or traditional justice, 
try to open your mind to seek restorative justice. And what is that? Well, mainly understanding that we are a society, and besides of your community, we are dealing with systemic issues, and that will, of course, affect your society. So this is a big uh, resume what I've just said. Um, responsibility is to be shared with the community, be transparent about your process, build together this code of conduct, which is this general agreement, seek for help, and respect anonymity. <laughs> I skipped that part. Uh, when you seek for help, you don't do names and describe the person. You try to keep the anonymity. That's super important, both for the victim or the person who felt hurt, but also who the person is being accused of something. Um, part of scaling up can be for the accused to feel so threatened that it comes a very a possibly scaling up situation. So ask for help, but preserve anonymity. And also the person who has felt hurt probably do not want to relieve that all the time. And you have to respect that. And the fifth, um, you always assume that restorative justice is about assuming the best intentions of people all the time. Sometimes this is very hard. Sometimes you really feel frustrated and you're like, uh, oh, the, the, I'm so mad with that. Breathe in, assume it was the best. Remember, we live under a culture of systemic, many injustice, but always privilege and protect the ones who felt hurt. It doesn't matter your opinion, your bias, and everyone has it on. Protect the one who felt hurt before. And I'm talking about this uh, weird word called a restorative justice, and it seems interesting, but what is that, right? It is a kind of a framework um, that is concerned in healing the victim's wounds. This is why uh, putting this person who felt hurt in front is the most important part. It gives uh, a chance to repair um, the harms that was done to this person, that has a voice in doing so and how to repair it. And it does provide the opportunity for us to grow as a community. It is not so simple, and it's hard, because you have to have the whole framework. It's not just like downloaded a code of conduct, but it can bring a lot of benefits. And what is key is that um, it, it held accountability. Maybe accountability is the best word to define all of this framework, besides of the safety and support. This is a little comparison that is super simple and easy to find image. So when we seek the traditional justice, it's like, a, oh my god, it has broken. You change that question to which kind of harm has been done. You go out of the thought of, it's, it's broken. What? Who? Who broke it? And pointing the finger, and you go to, to the thought of, what are the needs? What do they need what, to understand what happened? And you go out of, uh, which kind of punishment, punishment we need to do? to go to the idea of um, how can we repair this harm. And one example, this is, uh, apply, this has been applied in schools a lot, and in these examples, uh, there's like a, this zero tolerance policy that you go through, something happened, um, so you put a metal detector and a police search and then the teachers go to the class, you point the finger, this person becomes the evil, like a good and bad is a thing, for sure. And then, well, the, the school um, detains, this person goes to a juvenile or some punishment system, and it's done, you're out of society. And when you apply the other framework, you're like, okay, something happened, someone felt hurt. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about it and understand why that happened, why this person did what it did. This person knew what it was doing. Let's put those people together with some mediator and understand that so the person who hurt someone can listen to the person who was hurted and understand the harm he did. Because most of the time, I believe people do not know they are doing harm. At the end, you grow as a society and you have people integrated, there will probably become the voice for the ones to stop this from happening. 
like, a, okay, great, but how the heck do I apply that to my community when I'm doing that in volunteer-based time? <laughs> and I was not prepared to deal with human nature at all. And all of the things are really in between the lines. They are in a very opaque scale. So this is what we have done, and when, after going through something, trying to open our heads to understand how can we listen and held accountability, those are some things we learned. Um, always assume people's best intentions. Instead of uh, putting yourself in front, putting the finger and say, let's forbid this person to come into this place, because that was the first one. Send an email, say you're forbidden to come. We just assume the best intention. Um, not signing up the name, signing up as a community. No, it was not Paloma signing, it was the community assigning. We left very clear. Um, instead of saying, you did this that date, you changed the speech to, this person felt hurt on that date, and that, and then you use your code of conduct. That means that the code of, conduct, the code of conduct has been broken in this line. So this is why we're opening and leaving a space for reply if this person wants. But we need time to heal. So we ask you to kindly, please don't come in the next event because this person will be there and this person is hurt. But we're open to talk. We don't need to, you don't actually have to be open to talk because that is also a lot of time consuming for you on top of your regular job and on top of your own personal necessities and your community necessities. But time to you is quite important. But we're also acknowledging this is a systemic issue. We created or started creating a whole of self-educating material. It's not, um, I don't have the time or the possibility to educate everyone about uh, some things, and, uh, but I can offer a lot of material so the person can itself uh, try to search for something that it fits better. And then this is a list of resources. You can, um, a bunch of resources, and this is uh, where you can find the, the slides. And I believe that's what I had to share. I thank you a lot for coming and sharing your time. So thanks, Paloma. Thanks a lot. Is, are there any questions in the audience? I don't think I have any online questions. Yeah, I have a question about what happens before code of conduct uh, is applied. I have a friend uh, who actually tried to resolve a massive issue uh, before using code of conduct uh, by relying on individual community leaders and asking them to mediate. Uh, so, what do you think? Is it a good practice or is it a bad practice? To not have a code of conduct or to have the No, mediation? there is a code of conduct okay. uh, in that particular community, but uh, that person uh, decided that it would be better before applying uh, public code of conduct and before making a lot of people suffer and probably impacting mm. the community. Uh, they decided uh, to actually use informal process and try mediation. Got it. Is it, net, uh, is it a net positive thing or is it a massive risk from your opinion? So I think you're not talking that applying the code of conduct, but, but a punishment that uh, would prevail well, the code. Uh, normally, a lot of conduct, codes of conduct uh, assume that you try to mediate the issue, somehow resolve it before you apply the code of conduct because otherwise, well, it's not a good personal relationship. Uh, but uh, is it a good practice in a big community, or would you rather expect code of conduct to be always applied? I would expect, um, ideally, in the ideal scenario, you do have a very clear understanding that if something happened, there is something, um, a reaction for some action. And this is what I said about uh, let, let it to the person who commit the harm, let it clear why someone got hurt and why this is hurting the code of conduct. So when this is clear, you don't need to directly do a punishment. <laughs> You're being beaten three times. It's not like applying the punishment and trying to indeed mediate and solve. But the mediation part is what I find it tricky because you will be the front line and the target. 
and this is the worst. So if you try to mediate, don't do it alone, and do it on, with the community on your back. This is also why I understand that you don't sign your name, and you leave it ra really clear. Like, uh, um, it's different you're saying, you, you're wrong, you have to leave this room because you're seeing your cell phones right now. And it's different you're saying that and saying, hey, um, this person didn't feel to listen uh, because you, uh, instead of looking, you were looking straight or looking to the left. This harms the code of conduct. It is different. Do you, do you know what I mean? Does it make sense? So mediation is great because I believe you're talking about the punishment and, uh, implying the f and I'm kind of a, I always doubtful about enforcement of punishment. I very have serious issues with that. But you privilege always, always it's better to have a pun directly clear punishment system that your community feels safe and having nothing and always thinking about it, afraid of doing something. Because if someone felt hurt, the whole community will feel totally broken and unsafe. So it's better if you have a clear system that say, if you do something wrong, you won't be able to come to the event anymore. It's awful, but better than doing nothing. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Great talk, thank you. <laughs> In your experience, have you found a difference between creating a code of conduct for an online event versus an in-person event? And have you found longer code of conduct, conducts versus shorter code of conducts to be more useful? Massive difference between scale I'm not even sure about the um, online and digital, but scale. It's quite different when you deal with a 10, 50 people community and uh, 50,000. And especially because the 50,000, of course, will be online. And that means that you have like a, what happens in a thread uh, in a, when you have like a gazillions of talk at once and people and anonymity of the digital, that can be quite complicated. And in that case, as clear as possible, uh, I think uh, it's unfortunately necessary. It, it, you have less mailability for mediation and talk to talk. About the size of it, I always prefer the shorter ones that people will actually read it because the big ones you may think that happened, I will add that. And then it's, like a, it's just like a broken legal system that is so full of detail that it do not have the nuances of actually human nature. Personal opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you for, Thank you. for the talk. Um, I am really interested in hearing your thoughts uh, a little bit more on um, signing things anonymously when it's dealing with the code of conduct. Because I, for a smaller community or a large community with a small team managing it, there's only so many people that it could eventually be attributed to, especially if you have certain teams or like an ombudsman or something for the community that is managing code of conduct or code of conduct violations. So um, in those kinds of situations, is there a benefit still to signing anonymously or is it um, better to be more uh, transparent and say that these are the team members or uh, assuming that the team changes over time sometimes? Uh, how would you handle it in that kind of uh, situation where it's probably not too difficult to figure out who was involved in a decision? Oh, you know who's the team because the team is often like I stayed in the website or something, but you, I cannot be more explicit because of what we lived. Do not sign up Paloma. You sign up Pi Ladies Community, for example. Uh, my community. Um, if they know who they, they know who it is, but some kind of human psych psychology, if they read Paloma, you will become the directly target. And if you read the community, it, even if it's, it's I am the only organizer, it still feels different because you know it's not personal. It's not like a me fighting you, but you're in behind the whole community that you say I'm protecting this community in the name of being the responsible for it. It changes. So 
it's good to be explicit and they know. I think it's always transparency, they're always the best way to go. But don't sign specific names. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks, Paloma. That was really great. Thank you. <laughs>